Welcome to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, a program for and about women. Joyce Buford is a certified coach and motivational speaker who has a passion for helping women who need a second win. She is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Effortless Happiness, How to Find Your Voice and Finally Ask for What You Really Want. She studied directly with her mentor, Jack Canfield, and is a fully certified coach in his program. Also, she has served as an assistant in his training programs. Through her study with many prestigious coaches and mentors, she has created a powerful program that has positively impacted thousands of people. On today's program, Joyce and her guests will help you to get your second wind. Now here's your host, Joyce Buford. Good morning. Oh, it's great to have you here this morning. I, it is a beautiful day here, and I hope it is wherever you are. As you know, I would I like to always bring you up to where we are with the present uh, virus news, COVID-19, and we are slowly re-entering here in Texas into life. Some of us are more aggressive than others, and so the but the streets are awakening. We haven't yet. We've gone back to some limited restaurant eating, which I know a lot of people are real happy about, but still primarily takeout and things like that. So wherever you are, you can kind of do a comparison. How are we doing? How are we moving? Basically, I've always encouraged my listeners to use their own minds about deciding how they want to reenter. Just because government says you can go eat in restaurants, if that's not really where you are, if you haven't rebuilt that trust in the system and in the environment and that the trust that you would feel comfortable doing that, then I suggest you listen to your inner voice and stay where you are in safety and use your own timetable to reenter into public life. It's been quite a ride, hasn't it? <laughs> it? Certainly has been for me, and I know it's been for most people. I know getting back to work is very much needed for a lot of people for because they have struggled so much through this uh, loss of employment, loss of uh, loved ones, um, So many things that have affected different families. We've all been affected differently. So anyway, that's my encouragement to you is to use your own trust factor here. How do I trust my environment to allow me to reenter on a safe, in a safe way? So one of the things that I think has been a challenge for not only me, but other people as we move through some of those transitions in our lives that shake us to our core, that really, really cause the story is about he did something to me, she did something to me, and I can't quite forgive her. That is one of the biggest things we have to do as humans is to reclaim forgiveness for the perpetrator as well as for forgiveness for ourselves. I know I was uh, trying to f- forgive. My story was, of course, my transition in f- through divorce, and uh, it was getting to the point that I could really forgive my ex-husband for uh, the different things that happened in our marriage. And so it really had i been many years and I was still struggling with divorce and I was still struggling with forgiveness. And I'd read the Bible. I am a Christian. And I kept saying, I need to forgive. I need to forgive. I need to forgive. So I was asking a coach one day about, did she have any suggestions to help me make that change? Because with that change comes great forgiveness and great, great treasures, a lot of growth for, for me, uh, the forgiver. And so anyway, she said to me, totally caught me off guard. She said, I think you need to learn to forgive yourself first. I was like blown away. You would have thought she had just introduced something totally uncommon to me, which it was. I always thought the act was about them, not about me. So 
our guest today is going to really give us more insight about the power of forgiveness. I bet there's not one listener out there, not one, that doesn't have somebody that they need to use that forgiveness uh, gift to somebody, to themselves as well. Forgiveness for spending too much money. Forgiveness for that ugly word that you said. But even more forgiveness for major life changes. And we do that so that we can be free to grow and change and get the most out of us. So I'm thrilled to have our guest with us today because she is the epitome of somebody that could actually forgive a really, really powerful wrongdoing in her life. Brenda Adelman. How'd I do, Brenda? Adelman. Pretty good. Adelman, but that's all right. (laughs) Adelman. Well, okay, Brenda Adelman is an award-winning actress, a recipient of a Hero of Forgiveness Award, and has a master's degree in spiritual psychology. Now, she has performed a critical acclaimed one-woman show named My Bethlehem Hamlet, based on her Oh, sorry. Beth, I went in back into the Bible, <laughs> didn't I? <laughs> Brooklyn Hamlet. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm not going to share her story. I want her to share her story so that you can just really get the whole benefit of how major this forgiveness, act of forgiveness was for her. Anyway, she speaks and she talks about the story of the healing of the experience of forgiveness. How it, and her Her show is about the story of healing. It inspires others and makes money for over 12,000 people worldwide for audiences as diverse women prisoners. She's given this to women prisoners, youth at risk, spiritual communities, and at theater festivals all over the world. She's a speaker, a coach. And a solo host mentor with clients presenting their stories on stage in the U.S., Canada, and in European world. Now, most recently, as as world would have it, she has been helping entrepreneurs present themselves powerfully in live streams and in videos. Through her virtual video makeover weekend retreat and other courses that she's been doing online, she has been showing students where they can combine the power of their storytelling, personal styling, how to present them best personally, and the healing and the acting methods all coming together in a magnificent presentation. I'm excited about this because she appeals so much to so many things that I really respect about a a woman's life, a person's life, and how we can use those traumatic, traumatic events to really create and tell a powerful story about us. So anyway, I welcome Brenda to our our show today. Yay, Brenda, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, did you want me to maybe start with the traumatic story? Because uh, I, we, we on purpose didn't mention what that traumatic story was. And uh, yeah. just so I can share where I started as far as living on purpose. Oh, uh, yeah. In- I, wanted, I wanted that to come through you because you are the woman that can tell it the best. <laughs> So, so, well, here, I'm going to give you the title of my, um, of my Kindle book, which is going to say the, the story, and, and then I'll, I'll share a little bit more about it. So, my book is called My Father Killed My Mother and Married My Aunt, Forgiving the Unforgivable. Mm. And that kind of says it in a nutshell. Uh, in mm-hmm. 1995, my father, who I adored, I was daddy's little girl growing up shot my mother, who I 
adored. She was my best friend. He shot her in her head, killing her, and then within a month moved in with and then married my aunt, my mother's sister. And so my world exploded apart, really, with that bullet. My family, yeah. I lost my family in one night for all intents and purposes. And then if that wasn't enough, the whole other thing having to do with, with my aunt or who yeah. would then become my stepmother. Along the way, my father also went to prison, but only for two and a half years on a plea bargain because uh, his gun was never found. It, there was a cleanup. It was in Brooklyn, and uh, mob delayed a cleanup. And, and so my healing only started when I started first writing my story down on the pages of my journal because I was, like many of people are, I believe, taught you must forgive, you must forgive. And so I was mm-hmm. like, well, I'm going to forgive, I'm going to forgive. It's not, you know, it's not, nothing's going to bring my mother back, so I'm just going to forgive. But the truth was I had this anger and this rage inside of me. And like you mentioned in the introduction, with your process, I also learned that I had to forgive myself. And it's like, what? Why would I have to forgive myself? And for me, <laughs> in that instance, it was I had to forgive myself because I realized that since I had trusted my father and loved my father, I felt like I could never, ever trust myself again. And then the process that I teach and the process that I learned was how do I forgive myself? How do I reframe it? How do I see why I trusted him? And how could I learn to yeah. trust myself again? So um, the other thing is the process was I forgave my father. Uh, so I wrote my story down on the pages of my journal. Then I put my story up in front of an audience oh my god isn't that crazy in front of <laughs> in, in los angeles terrified but yeah. there was an inner guidance in me that was like you must put your story up and then the third part of really being free to live a life of love and peace was when i forgave my father i forgave him but i also took him to court for wrongful death and it was a process over many years so so that's kind of what i bring to the table with um with what that's- i've done and yeah. That, Brenda, that is not anybody's normal life at all. And I can't, when you and I visited about, I mean, you really adored your husband, I mean, your father. You had a strong relationship with him. And then yeah. to have somebody just crush you to to kill your mother. I mean, I'm trying to put my head around the relationship, the power of the family unit that was broken that one night. Yeah, that I was, was very close. I was I was codependently close with both of my parents, and these are all words I didn't even know about before. I was an adult when this happened, but I was like the role in my family was because my my parents were still married. That. um you know, they made each other so unhappy that I was always trying to like go go in the oh, middle and be the one that would okay. make them happy. You know, and I so I had a, a separate relationship with both of them that was very different. But but I I loved them both so much, and I had moved away to Los Angeles about six months, well nine months before this happened. And yeah. um, but in in those nine months, I saw my parents on six different occasions. That's how close I was with them. Yes, and then my father did this. And um, I wouldn't say it came out of vacuum, like, it, you no, know, and, you know, oftentimes oh, okay. when you look back, I imagine this happens with divorce, too. Oftentimes, if you really look back, you're like, oh, there are signs, but we're in mm-hmm. denial often, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I just, now, did you have another uh, sibling? Do you have a sibling, yeah. or are you the only yeah. child? yeah. Yeah, I have I have a brother. He's a half brother, and uh-huh. so it was my father who killed our mother. And if there was ever, you know, my we were brought up like you know as we were as if we were completely brother and sister. He's my older brother, but boy, did that test us because it was my father who killed our mother. And there was a, there's a lot there, but I'll say the biggest thing because it created a, like a six year rift in our relationship is that. He, my brother knew that my father did this intentionally mm. and I, and I moved into denial and that was the biggest thing. Um, and of course we were also unconscious back then as far as I certainly hadn't done any inner work. And, uh, but my brother and I ha- since then have reconciled. We actually reconciled when I made the decision to take my dad's court for wrongful death. And, um, my brother and I 
came together then. And actually, my one-woman show, which I have now performed for over 12,000 people, is uh, he had he was living in, he is living in Vienna, Austria, and he was running a theater a Jewish theater company, and um, mm. and he ended up producing a big theater festival there and and producing my one woman show at his theater and it was this moment ah! of life life and art coming together it was incredibly healing amazing we did the Q&A for the show to get you know after the show together yeah yeah you did Q&A did you say yeah we after did a question and answer after the show together on the stage with this i have this larger than life size painting of our mom that you know, yeah. I had that I took after she died. It was incredible. It was an incredible moment of healing. With uh, so much acting in, in, in you and your brother, was your uh, were your parents also from the acting world, performing world? Yeah, that's a great question. My mom was an artist. <laughs> she was okay. a, a, an award winning photographer and a painter. Mm-hmm. And always an artist since she was yeah. younger. My mother took us to Broadway plays from the time we were children and enrolled us in acting classes and uh, took us to museums. And my father was kind of was blue collar. He, he owned his own business, an auto parts business that was my grandparents' business before then. He was like a super salesman. And my mother mm-hmm. was educated. My father, you know, just graduated from high school. My mother had a master's, yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, it is interesting, but I want to go over again how you once, uh, I guess there was, you didn't go right, well, you did go right into a trial. So I'm trying to remake that, that no, it's, uh, yeah, period of, of healing was yeah. you, you started with writing. Is that it? That was the thing that where you started. Well, no. Well, my healing started when I when I was writing. The timeline's kind of funny, so I'll I'll explain it for for a minute. Um, okay. My father. Okay, so my father had a lawyer in place when yes. this happened, so he didn't talk to the police. So they were uh-huh. trying to get a plea bargain, and they were trying to pretend like it was an intruder. Mm-hmm. And um, my father still wasn't arrested yet. He was. You know, he, he was being questioned, but, I mean, the lawyer was being questioned. And then um, there was an answer. This, this is the nitty-gritty most people don't ask. This is a good question. Um, <laughs> there was an answering machine tape that my father left, like, a, 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 a message on my brother's answering machine, and that ended up being evidence to show that that is not what happened. And oh. uh, and um to make a long story short, he my father was basically arrested after there was a grand jury trial to see if there was evidence or something like that. And then he ended up going to prison on a plea bargain one year later. So he was out for the first year. Um, oh. he, went to, he went to jail one year later, and it was a mm-hmm. plea bargain, so we never got any answers. And it was for one and a half to five years. He got out in two years for good behavior, for killing my mother. And then that did not seem like any kind of justice. And so the only justice or recourse we had was to take him to court for wrongful death. I thought I would get answers about what happened because he wouldn't Mm -hmm. ever say. And instead Mm -hmm. he skipped town. His lawyer was there. He skipped town and I never saw him again. We won a $2 million judgment on wrongful, wrongful death, but we never collected. And that, that was about six years later, that trial. So you, Mm -hmm. so your father is out there somewhere. My father died in 2004, but he was living in Florida. he He was living in Florida where the, where the legal system protects criminals and protects money so we didn't get to collect the judgment yep ah. wow what a story so, <laughs> now so i have been called the forgiveness queen it might be why because there was one thing after another <laughs> after there was a lot of heartache and there was a lot of um, levels and depth to the journey of forgiveness so yeah. that's one thing I definitely want your audience to know is like this is not like a one and done it was like I start so the the healing journey was um me really not wanting to live, me thinking this is just too much, I've lost too much, to a uh, person and finally going back to acting class about a year after my mom died, 
And I didn't even realize I was saying out loud that I didn't want to live. And then a friend said to me, oh, I'm going to cry, you know, if you take your own life, you're not going to be with your mother again. And that Mm -hmm. was enough because I loved my mother so much for me to have a shift and say, oh, I want to thrive. I need to thrive for my mom. And that was enough, my loving for her to say, okay, I got to get up in the back. I got, I, I have to figure out a way to have joy again. And then, um, and then I started writing. And so taking my thoughts out of my head and putting them on the journal was so important for my healing because in my head was, I hate him. I love him. I hate him. I love mm-hmm. him. It was like the back yeah. and forth. But when I was able to put it onto my journal, I could recognize just how much I'd been through and that I didn't need to compartmentalize. I needed to get this out. And then, um, and then I started writing my one woman show because that was natural for me as a, as an actress. That was a way for me to express what was going on based on some mm. very dark poetry that I wrote when I couldn't sleep at night. I turned one of my poems into a three person scene, my brother, me and my father. And then I expanded ah. on that, put, put it up in class a couple of years later, probably terrified. I hadn't done any of the inner work that I'd done I, I'm not religious but I'm spiritual and mm-hmm. um I, I, I'm now. I wasn't then. Uh although for me I seriously felt God source whatever someone calls that directly mm-hmm. on the night my mother died. So that set me on a whole other path of knowing there was something bigger than me. And um mm-hmm. I I put the show up terrified in a top acting class in Los Angeles. You know, it was a storytelling exercise, and instead of the judgment, I had people, I had a 10-minute standing ovation. I had people sharing with me secrets that they had had and been ashamed of, and that gave me the impetus to turn that, like, 20-minute piece into the one-woman show that I have today. So then um, in, in the show, I play several characters, one being my father, and as an actor, to be a good actor, you can't play yourself as a villain because nobody plays himself as a villain. And so in... In performing my father's character, I got to understand him more as a human being, never condoning what he did, but understanding different aspects of people that want something so badly and they don't know how to get it or if there's mental illness involved, all kinds of things like that. And then um, taking my dad's court for wrongful death was probably one of the biggest, most courageous decisions I ever made, and I did it from self-love versus punishment. And so mm-hmm. it was in a master's program in spiritual psychology that I learned all the tools to forgive, to set healthy boundaries, and also those are the tools that I use in my coaching. Okay, so the process for you in the healing uh, was the writing, opened the door to the writing. And then was it then that you went back to acting and that's when you decided to share your story that you had been yep. writing about? Yep. Now, I, I, I have to tell people that I've, I've done something similar. I don't think my forgiveness piece was nearly as great as involving murder and killing and all of that. But I can tell you from my experience, you are so scared. I can't imagine the, the fear, the doubt, the, the, all those excuses and reasons that we run through our mind that it must have taken for you to have gotten up in front of your acting class. I don't know how big it was. I would think 30, maybe. 100 people. Oh, my gosh, 100 people. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, I just fell to my knees. Um, I I just did a video. I just did a video on Facebook about it because I remembered that first time and how terrified I was. Oh, I can't imagine. And so... I mean, it took so much courage to do that. But tell me, uh, we we know that about the beginning, the, the the getting up on the stage was like a huge thing, even mm-hmm. though you were used to being on stage. Oh, and it's act- so different. Telling your story is so different. Mm-hmm. And this is the thing right now, you know, today, I've been doing, yeah. I've been presenting my story for over 15 years. But Mm -hmm. I have all the tools because that was the first time I put my story up. I hadn't done my two-year master's program where I learned how to, like, do the inner child's work and do the forgiveness work and do the setting healthy boundaries. So it was really hard. And so what I teach my clients, too, it's like I teach them when they have big stories 
to do the crafting of it, but also do mm-hmm. the inner work. Because I did go up, and, and I had my first production, my public production, probably a year or so after that first time I put, put the, the short piece up. Yes. And, and people would laugh, and people would cry because I'm a skilled actress. And then I would go home and be absolutely miserable because I didn't know how to protect myself. I didn't know how to take on, not take on the audience's stuff. I didn't know... You know, uh, I didn't know how to fill myself up. So that's why my process is very specific. It's like, that's why I almost have like a, like this, um, what's it called? I have a pet peeve with a lot of coaches that are like, go be vulnerable. Go tell your story. Go do this. And because mm-hmm. I've been honored to hear really personal stories because of how I share, I know that that is not the best advice. Because if people share too much, they will run in the opposite direction. They'll just close back down because they'll feel too exposed, or someone will judge them and they'll and they'll feel too exposed, or they'll get defensive. Or the other problem people have is is they don't share enough vulnerability because they haven't worked with their emotions. So yeah. you know, yeah. so it's really it's really important to. Um, I mean, that yeah. said, you don't have to be <laughs> fully healed to to. Um, present your story because I feel like I healed because I was presenting it, you know? Yes. Well, yeah, that first time you do the story, I mean, for multiple times we practiced over and over. All I had to say was one line. I didn't have a, a acting situation right. that lasted for 30 in an hour, you know. I just had one line. I had to say. Wow. And it was like, Oh, major job for me. So I <laughs> applaud you. I mean, that's so much courage, my dear, to Thank stand you. up there and really express yourself. I could tell you're an actress. I could tell you'd have to yeah. be able to just <laughs> well, allow you know what? emotion. But anyway, you know we're gonna. I just yeah. hate to break here, but we have to break. So we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about this process that was necessary for Brenda to get up on that stage. I mean, to to get that over that performance over and over and over and keep the passion, keep the audience connected to the story so that plus – I just want to know how somebody does a one woman show. That sounds <laughs> difficult. So we will be back. We will be back shortly and Brenda will share this information with us. Transformational coach, motivational speaker and author Joyce Buford returns after this short break. Close your eyes and imagine living your life without limits. Where would you go? Who would you meet? What would you do? During an Uncover Your Hidden Genius session, you will discover what's keeping you from living your life with purpose, passion, and fulfillment of your potential. You'll get a clear vision of the steps you need to take to uncover your hidden genius so that you can live a life without limits. Sessions can be done over the phone, Skype, or in person. Find out more at www.JoyceBufordEmpowers.com or by calling 903-287-0747. Welcome back to this segment of Second Win. Joyce Buford, the author of Effortless Happiness, continues in this segment to share insights that will help you live a life of greater purpose and filled with happiness. Now here's our host, author and coach, Joyce Buford. We are talking today with Brenda Adele. Oh gosh, Brenda, if we hadn't spent so much time talking about this, Adelman. Brenda Adelman. Adelman. (laughs) Adelman. That's brief. I should say Edelweiss. Right. Yes. 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 But is this not just the most fascinating story out there, listeners? It's just almost, it has to be a written. It, I, it's hard to believe that it could be real. Um, Experience. Yeah. To now, even though you were playing it on the stage, and and I just want to ask this. How does someone keep their energy 
up night after night or just start doing one performance. How did you decide to do how long is the performance? Uh, how did you decide what are the characters? Tell us a little bit about the performance. Yeah, well, it it was one of these moments in time, and I don't know how the listeners are, how you are, where I recognized when I did that storytelling exercise, I recognized that everything in my life had prepared me for this moment. The fact that I had been in acting classes for a decade, the fact that my mom took me to Broadway shows from the time I was a little girl, to the fact Mm -hmm. that I went to many one-man and one-woman shows, including a show by Lynn Redgrave called Shakespeare for My Father. I saw True (gasps) about Truman Capote. I saw Night Mother with Kathy Bates. And so my natural way of expressing myself and understanding emotions and language was in theater. And so... Uh My mother also had read Shakespeare to me from the time I was a little girl. And so in my darkest despair, I remembered that Shakespeare's Hamlet lived through something like I did. His father was killed by his uncle, and his uncle married his mother. In my (gasps) case, my father killed my mother and married her sister. And the reason this is so important is that it was my first moment of recognizing that I wasn't alone, and it's why I share my story so much. Because that moment when I realized somehow I wasn't alone because someone in history had to have lived through something I did, it mm-hmm. it made me feel better. And so <clears throat> acting, doing a one-person show, is a very difficult experience. Uh, mm-hmm. It is something I poured my heart and soul into, and to have a really good one, you have to, right? Because anybody could kind of yeah. write a short scene. My show is 60 minutes, and that's a great amount of time as far as there's a lot of, uh, you probably don't know this, there's a lot of theater festivals around. There's something called fringe festivals where mm-hmm. you could literally be doing, uh, it, so it's different than speaking, although I have used my one-woman show. Str- I've been hired as a keynote doing my show exactly as it is. I've also changed it and done like half an hour of it and it's spoken for half an hour on my message, which is about forgiveness. But um, awesome. th- there are festivals around the world that you can get booked into and they usually want a one-hour uh, one hour spot. Uh, mm-hmm. I've taken my one hour and when I've only had 30 minutes to speak, I've even done only eight minutes of it for pay. And I've been able to get, once you have an excellent show, you can edit it. You can pick and choose what pieces will fit the audience that you're performing mm-hmm. for. And the way to keep energy up, <clears throat> I tapped into all the tools I used over the years studying uh, and doing theater in New York. And I tell you, it's a good question because It's a job. It can get to be a job. I did my show six performances a week in London for three weeks. You got to bet that when I'm going in for the second performance on a Saturday, it takes energy and it takes focus and it takes not doing it by rote. I have all the skills. You know, once we get used to doing something, you can do it and you can do it well. But my goal is not to just do something excellent. I want to be alive and I want each audience member to – I I. I want to change people's hearts. I say, I don't want, I would, I mean, ultimately I'd love it if everybody in the audience, their hearts just broke open and they could start healing. But I also learned a long time ago because it would kind of feel my energy is that my goal is now to touch one person in the audience because I'm not responsible for anybody or everybody. Mm -hmm. Like that's actually draining. So I also practice, breathing. I practice getting into my body. I practice, and this comes from just being on so many stages as far as having it be a give and take with the audience versus just giving everything out. Like it's a living experience. That's why theater is so amazing. So that that's how I prepare. I do sound uh, exercises, voice exercises, vocal exercises, body exercises. I do cardio on days that I'm performing. I eat really well dishes that I know are not going to take a lot of, uh, uh, digest, you know, I don't eat before the show, so I don't have to be working on my digestion while I'm on stage, things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to ask you this. Do you have the ice bath after performance? I, I know not. some people that... I would never. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why, well, why I, I think that? that takes a lot of courage to, to jump in, but I do know several performers that they do because they're they're so active on the stage, and so and it helps with inflammation and um, you know activity. So it's kind of a way of protecting the body. <laughs> but yeah, and I I've heard. Remember. I mean, a lot of people do hydrotherapy and stuff like that. For me, yeah. it does take a while for me to wind down after a show, Mm -hmm. but I'm already taking care of myself. Like I'm making sure I'm taking care of myself and I'm making sure I'm getting plenty of sleep. For me, I'm like, I don't want to take a hot bath versus an ice bath. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. So, um, you know, everything's very important that you do it personal to yourself. You know, what works for yourself. Right. Now, I do need to ask, how many different roles do you, do you play in your play? I think it's about 10 or 11. Let me, let me work this through. I play myself at different ages. Yeah. Oh yeah. So much fun. I play myself at different ages. So maybe, uh, you know, me as a little girl and then me as different ages in my life. Then I play boyfriends that I've had, my ex fiance, my mother, my father, the cops, um, the lawyer. My brother, yeah, yeah so, uh, my ex. It's like, yeah, there's probably probably ten or eleven. And how do you, when you change from one person to the other, how do you do that? Do you do it through a piece of garment, or do you voice change, or how do you do that? Yeah, I do uh, different things, and it's changed over the years. When I did it in the beginning, I was more dependent on like changes of clothing. Right. So if I was my mother, I had a certain piece of clothing. If I was my father, I had a certain piece of clothing. Uh, I've worked with several different directors. I had one director who like took all of my props and wigs and everything away. And then what I finally, um, wow. what I do now, what works best is I, I actually have a fedora hat that was my father's and I mm-hmm. open up. When I'm playing him with him with the fedora, I used to have a cigar. I usually don't have a cigar now. I usually just kind of mime it. Um, mm. With my mother, I open up the show exactly as the painting that I have of her. So she had blonde hair, so I have a blonde wig on, and I have the shirt that she had on, and I'm opening in the position that she's sitting in. Um, mm. And then, and then I think that's pretty much it. I might have a scarf or some like a hair tie for my hair when I'm a teenager I don't always use those things the biggest things are my mother and my father uh those props however that said I open with them and then I let mm-hmm. them go and I let the acting take over I do change the ah. way my body is I change the way I'm standing I change my voice um and I yeah it's body language and voice and the way you I move and the language is different for them mm-hmm. in the right yeah yeah Wow. That's a, that is so powerful. I, it's <laughs> kind of crossed my mind. Do you ever do this for, um, acting schools or colleges as sort of features for their, their acting classes? I've only, this- so far, I would love to do it more. I did, um, I was hired to do my show for a theater and dance department for a school in <laughs> New York. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was from someone who was on faculty who saw me do the show at a festival at a festival in Vienna, Austria, and um, he brought me in. And then I teach on forgiveness, and so it was really lovely because he had me then do a workshop afterwards for the students on my three-step forgiveness process. And then I also did the show for a high school, uh, like a private mm-hmm. high school. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, what was so wonderful is the, the students in the acting class, they did my lights and my sound and everything else. So that was really cool. I also had a school come, like a high school class come to see me do the show at a theater after the principal of the school had seen my, uh, had seen my show. So yeah, I mean, I'd yeah. love to do it more because it's very, very empowering for, um, uh, for them, and yeah, it, I would love to do it as even in teaching people how to do the one person show. I teach people how to do a one person show, but not in the school format yet. Right? Yeah. There's so much potential there. I mean, I love the the fact that you could change lives so early. I mean, a student, you could not only in, embellish their acting skills and show the 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 different varieties of acting that you could do, and 
changing characters, but you could also teach such a powerful life lesson. Oh of yeah, forgiveness. yeah. I was um yeah. I was a guest artist in the classroom and uh in a high school also from someone who had seen me do the show. Uh, and there I did like parts, I did scenes from my show and then I taught about Shakespeare. And then I also have done my show, like pieces of the show and taught on forgiveness for youth at risk at times yeah. as well. Awesome. Yeah. I love, re- I love reaching the younger people. Like to me, I feel like I have so much at stake when I'm performing and teaching them because I, yeah, like you said, they can literally change the trajectory of their life by the mm-hmm. lessons that I'm teaching. And what I love about doing the show or doing scenes of the show in addition to teaching my method is it's a different way. It's not preaching. Doing a show is even different than right. speaking. People listen different. They listen to the show and watch the show more like mm-hmm. they would listen to music. So they're being taught, but they're not being preached to. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, the, the show walls has, are down. My, <laughs> yeah, and my show, the me, the message underneath all the entertainment is about forgiveness. Yeah. Now, if my listener wanted to get more of your information, and I know you have some things coming up, I love that you've turned toward media as a tool for getting your message out there. Because, you know, now with COVID-19, it's honestly opened the world to many, many, many more opportunities that we all can have. Um, and so you have a storytelling what do you have on your website that people need to go to to see? Let me give the, yeah, let me give the link because okay. I have a few things coming up, but I think what would be great, I have this three part video training that mm-hmm. is about, you get, um, they'll get the seven top ways to share their story, to showcase their talent, make an impact and build an audience, the top rookie mistakes that I've made that will save your listeners time and money and five tools to get out of your own way and finally shift it to flow and attraction energy. So that's mm-hmm. at forgivenessandfreedom.com, which is my website, forgivenessandfreedom.com slash free training. I don't actually think that's on the site right now if you look for it, but so that you want to put forgivenessandfreedom.com slash free training and then you'll, okay. and then you'll be able to get that. And it's a three part okay. video training. Very, very helpful. Lots of content. Okay. So it's forgiveness, forgiveness and freedom dot com. Yeah. So it's forgiveness and the freedom. I'm just saying instead of a plus sign, it's an end. Forgiveness and freedom dot com slash Free training. Oh, good. Okay. Now, if somebody was really wanting to touch base with you, get to maybe visit with you, because you do do one-on-one coaching, correct? If somebody was trying yes. to make a transition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do one-on-one coaching, too. I have a calendar, but, you know, my email is brenda at forgivenessandfreedom.com. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm on Facebook. I'm all over Facebook. Oh my God. <laughs> it's my New York accent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and what I is your Facebook? Facebook? What's your Facebook page? I'd say just my profile page is Brenda Edelman. Oh, okay. And then I do yeah. have a storytelling group as well and, uh, and a video group. Mm-hmm. But Brenda Edelman is the way to Get there, ask me questions, message me if you'd like to explore one-on-one coaching or get on a short call. Yeah. So how did, you know, we've talked about the forgiveness and the tremendous forgiveness that you, for somehow I think your, your whole message was more difficult than my message. Isn't that funny? We compare our, our grievances. I know. Uh, isn't that silly? Everybody's message is, is really important to them. The of only, course. you know, the thing about, I mean, the thing about mine is that it's, it is Shakespearean. That's why my one woman shows called my book on Hamlet. But, uh, but everybody, it, we're all connected through how we've gotten through the losses or how we have, have moved through, like the, through the resilience, you know, we can be connected also through the resilience that we've all had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if somebody is wanting to, uh, they've gone through, 
a, a very sad and they've been suffering with the forgiveness piece. And is there something, where would they naturally come? Would they talk to you? Would they connect with you? Would they go to your website and you would have something? Oh, to- well, I have a really, well, I, the, the best thing to do is probably to talk to me because then I can tell them how I think I could best help them or where to start. Cause I have a book, you know, I have the Kindle book. I have um, yeah. a really, uh, I mean, the thing I would recommend really, I don't have the page up right now, is um, I have a 30-day do-it-yourself program called Phoenix Rising, a 30-day journey into and through forgiveness. It's a digital training that I've, re- I've run live several times. It's mm-hmm. a $200 program, but since COVID started, I have it as a pay-what-you-can starting at $30. I can mm-hmm. get you that. I can get you that um that that list, it, it's, uh, I mean, that URL, I'm so proud of this program. It is everything I learned. It's 30 days of lessons from all the different techniques that I have, um, that, that, that I've used and that I've coached my clients with since 2005. So oh, it it's, sounds it's powerful. So powerful. Really wonderful. It is. I, it was one of those things that was channeled to me about a year and a half ago. And since COVID, like I said, I've made it a pay what you can option. So that if people can pay, obviously, then you can support my ministry and pay the 222 but it also starts at $30 for those people who um, who can't afford right. that. And and then, of course, I work one-on-one with people as well. And I, I have a group program, but that's not open right now, <clears throat> specifically on forgiveness. Yes. So is that not on your website? I mean, yeah. it's not on there? That would be... That would be nice if it was on my web. <laughs> it's, uh, I actually have to update. I have to update that. Let me. I can look. I can look while we're still on to see what the URL is because uh, I'm so proud of that program. Or let me go. You know what? Here it is. It's probably. It could possibly be on my forgiveness page. So I have a forgiveness page on Facebook. That is. Uh-huh. Um, it's forgiveness and freedom. So it's just uh, facebook.com slash. Forgiveness and Freedom, and mm-hmm. let me pull that up because probably the program Phoenix Rising might be on there. So I'm thinking. Or it's on a lead page. Let's see. Technology. I tell you what, you got to embrace technology <laughs> right now. I know. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it before we... <laughs> okay. But, you know, right now there are a lot of people that are... are Perhaps not dealing with, with, uh, a, a, we're all dealing with a certain part of grieving over this, this whole COVID-19, just how the, the virus has affected our life. I mean, it's yeah. put people in bad positions, bad. I mean, they're broke, they have no job, and there's a lot of anger out there. And, yeah. you know, there's anger, but there's like nobody to be angry at. I mean, you could be angry at the boss, but is the boss really the one that, I mean, how far does the ladder go? And so there's a lot of people out there with misdirected anger. I mean, we're all oh, angry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and so it makes it really difficult for families to be thrown together for weeks on end for all of this that we have experienced. And we haven't, you know, I've been surprised at the graduation exercises and the marriages that have been altered. And they get so mad at the school officials, but really they're, they're caught in the middle. They have to abide by the law or what's presently being presented to them, and yet they have to keep their students safe. And we've got all sorts of different responses. So whether we like to call that what it is, it is a way of grieving that we are going through. We have to grieve that that student couldn't have the graduation that she maybe thought she would always have or the bride didn't have the marriage, the wedding ceremony she thought she would have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when someone shared to me that the grieving process is for everything that changes in our life, every transition, we grieve. 
it doesn't always look the same. We think we only grieve if we die, if somebody dies. But right. every time something ends, we have to grieve. Be yeah. sad. And we have to get that out. So I think your program would be so awesome for them to be able to get that. And Oh, actually, yeah. I um. Awesome. I, I've been looking for the page. It's so funny. I found the page, but it only says the 222. It doesn't. I can't find the one that has the pay what you can right now, but probably on <laughs> forgiveness and freedom, it's there. And I will, I will send it to you later. Um, I wanted to say about that program. The uh-huh. first week is on self forgiveness. The uh-huh. second week is on. There's a theme of a week. The second week is on forgiving your mother. The third week is on forgiving your father, and the fourth week is on forgiving God. And this speaks exactly to what you're saying. The point of power is within us. We are not. I mean, you can say, uh, you know what? People can say, I disagree with you, and that's fine. But if you're mad, this happens a lot with politics. Um, You know, we're so mad at what's happening out there when the real, what, what we're angry about, if we go one step further, is our projections and how we feel powerless to make a change. So the real change comes with looking within yourself. Where are you out of control in your life? And I think with COVID right now, that is a lot of the anger that's coming out is like we're realizing just how much we don't have control. But the whole point is we never had control. Like if you could understand that we nothing is guaranteed. So now that we're in this world that it's like, but I, whenever we are looking for security outside of ourselves, we are, we are, what is it, barking up the wrong tree? Like security <laughs> is not outside, especially for those of us who, um, I mean, in many, many ways, I feel blessed because of what I lived through in my life because I found a way to understand that there's something bigger than me, God, spirit, universal presence, there's something here bigger than me that I personally believe is a good force, which means that despite the circumstances, something is happening here that is for me. And, yes, you can say, but what do you mean? People are dying. People are sick. But but what it, this is testing our belief system. Like any time you're in life and something doesn't work out the way that we want it to, it's testing our beliefs. How much faith do you have? And do you believe that if someone dies that it is – like death is part of life. Like I lost yeah. everything in my life, and I'm grateful for the fact that because of that, I learned a certain resilience that right now I can look at the world and be like, wow, this looks messed up. This is upside down, and yet the outer world is going to look better by how I treat myself, where I look inside myself and say, where have I been attached to my job, to this person, to the government, to being taken care of? Where am I fearful? And then going within, and in my process, it's very much like I forgive myself for judging myself as, feeling out of control in this moment. The truth is I can breathe. The truth is I, I'm grateful for my breath. The truth is I can meditate right here in this moment. In the in the beginning when you talked about how a coach of yours told you you need to forgive yourself, yes, oh, my God, I had to forgive myself with my father killing my mother. What? What yes. I learned is I couldn't <laughs> forgive him if I didn't forgive myself. What did I have to forgive myself? How could I have you know, trusted my father. Well, of course I trusted my father because he was my father. I also had to forgive my mother. I've had people say, what do you mean you have to forgive your mother? I had to forgive her for the way she showed me it was okay to be mistreated by someone who says they love you. Like we have to get, we have an opportunity to get real about ourselves. So in relationships, you know, you're talking about like relationships are having challenges right now. Of course they are, but it happens also with with divorce, something when people have bad divorces, they blame that other person and they're unwilling to look at the fact that they chose that person, whether or not they got hoodwinked is another story. Yeah. It's like, because I don't think people want to take responsibility because it feels like then they're going to beat themselves up. It's not. It's like, I need to take responsibility for the fact that I didn't think my father would do this. Well, right. that it's like, well, what, what do you mean? Well, there were signs, and even in relationships, there's almost always a sign. But if I say, well, I'm just never going to forgive myself because I, in, in a marriage or a relationship, I, I can't, I'm not going to take responsibility that that person has taken all my money after we've broken up, because how dare they? They did all that stuff. Well, you gotta, that's not where any healing is going to take place because you're victimized by them. And when you're a victim, you're not empowered. You have to look within and say, okay, 
I chose that person. Maybe I chose them because I had low self-esteem. Maybe I chose them because I had right. low hoodwinks, but it doesn't matter. Let me forgive myself. Like, instead of beating ourselves up, it's a chance to love ourselves more. Do some um, self uh, inner child, you know, to have this, like, part of you that is scared and doesn't believe that us as an adult can take care of them. It's like having that connection with your inner child, loving yourself, not jumping to another person or not yeah. repeating repeating what you think love is, right? My dad was a narcissist, yeah. so I attracted a couple of narcissists in my life because that <laughs> felt like love before I understood the pattern. So it's like, where uh-huh. can we look at our responsibility? So if you're getting mad at a someone who is enforcing rules or someone who's wearing a mask, when you're not wearing a mask, it's like, where is the kindness? And, and mm-hmm. where is that hostility mm-hmm. coming from? You would never... Yeah want to treat yourself as badly as you're treating workers or media or someone else who is like trying to protect themselves with a mask, you know, it's like, well, Brenda, I've got to stop you. I could tell you are passionate about that because there's so much <laughs> great information. I hate to stop you, but <laughs> That's okay. they're going to cut me off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Brenda does have a message and she found forgiveness and that's why I'm so thrilled that she was on this show today. Now, I know Thank you've you. gotten something out of this. So go to her website, which is... Uh, uh, forgiveness and, and Freedom. Forgiveness, yeah, forgiveness and freedom dot com. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Brenda. Thank this you. This has been very, very uh informational and growth certainly lots of growth so thank you for being with us we will see you next week folks and i am looking forward to it please go out and make this week one that is memorable start working on forgiving yourself for being angry at the man that's wearing the mask or the woman that's not wearing the mask so anyway (laughs) please go, go out there and change your world starting with you first Have a great week. Joyce Buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of Second Wind. Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com. Thank you.